are reading from Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11. So it says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in the wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he had music and dancing. So he called to one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. Amen. Thank you, Julia. Why don't we take a moment, stand up, turn to someone next to you and say, God loves you. (laughs) you. Or you can say sitting if you really want. All right, that's enough. Sit back down. It was three words. Shouldn't take that long. My name's uh, Nick Van Ruth. I'm one of the pastors here at Hills Baptist. Uh, Thank you. God does love me. I need reminding every now and again. Um, uh, We're we're in this series uh, called First Love. We had this whole whole other thing planned, uh, but the staff and the pastors and and, uh, leaders of the church just felt we needed to stop, slow down, and focus on Jesus. Yesterday, I was... Out uh, on a date with my wife Emily, we went to the Lane Vineyard, and going in, uh, if you've ever been, it's just beautiful scenery, right? Beautiful rolling hills, vineyards, and multiple times while we were there, we just looked out and went, wow, like how beautiful is God's creation. It was such a blessing to have that moment just to stop and to enjoy and appreciate and celebrate God's creation. To have that moment to stop and smell the roses, in a sense. I think this month is, is we're doing just that. We're stopping and we're, we're looking at Jesus. We're grounding ourselves and reminding ourselves, who is Jesus? What's he all about? And just dwelling in that like leaning in to go closer. Last week, Dave shared a message on on waiting on God in prayer. And today, we want to look at what is Jesus on about? What is his mission and his message? Uh, To do that, we're going to look at that parable that was shared 
just before, the, par- the parable of the prodigal son, it's often known as. I would suggest we should call it the pra- par- parable, or the parable, <laughs> the parable of the lost sons. Plural. Ooh. Mm. Oh. We're going to have a lot of moments of life. The context of this par- parable uh, is um, Jesus sharing this parable with a whole heap of Pharisees. Now, Pharisees are the religious elite. And if you have your Bibles open, open them up to Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were gathering all around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The, the, the Pharisees, teachers of the law, the religious elite, the, the, the super uh, saints of the day, people who'd done it all right and wore the right things, said the right things, did the right things, the elite in society. And Jesus was this was famous teacher traveling around and healing and you know, kind of a celebrity, and yet he was hanging out with sinners, with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with thieves, with robbers, with murderers. Don't the, the, and the Pharisees are muttering like, doesn't he know how despicable they are? How horrible uh, uh, they are to our community? Shouldn't, shouldn't a, a, a rabbi of all people be hanging out with, with the proper and the good like us? And so they're muttering and And to respond to that, Jesus obviously hears that. And he responds in verse 3. He tells them a parable. We're going to notice a few things as we go along. The first thing to notice in verse 3, it's parable singular. And then it goes, and yeah, another. hmm. But there's three parts to this parable. Parable singular, but three parts. And each parable kind of expands on on the last, and they're all about loss and pursuit, repentance and rejoicing. Loss and pursuit, repentance and rejoicing. And the first one, and like these these parables are, are well known in Christian circles. If you've grown up in the church, you've probably heard these before. That's good. And it's good to return to this kind of stuff because this is foundational uh, to, to who we are as Christians and to who God is and, and what's he on about. And so Jesus, verse 3, tells them this parable, the first parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So imagine, imagine this scenario and imagine if you were listening to this as a first century Jewish person. Uh, and in that culture, was it an agrarian culture, a lot of agriculture, uh, a lot of shepherds, that was a very normal thing. And uh, people, people would have sheep and a hundred sheep, that's a decent amount of sheep to have uh, in that flock. And uh, they lose one. This shepherd loses a sheep. Now normally... That's, that's unfortunately a pretty normal experience for shepherds to lose sheep. Like in, in, that, in that area, there's over, there's, there'll be a million different reasons why a sheep might go lost. It could have been killed by a wolf or something. It could have been stolen or it could have just wandered off or it could have not have been able to keep up with the herd as they travel, the, the flock as they travel. It's all these different reasons it's very normal, unfortunate, but very normal for shepherds to lose sheep. But this shepherd, uh, he leaves the 99, it says, in open country. Like he leaves those who were able to keep up with him, were able to, to hear his voice and follow along. 
you know, did the right thing, lived the right way, he leaves them to go and pursue the one like, and puts all of them at risk in the open country. And he goes and pursues the lost sheep. And then he finds it, he brings it back, and he rejoices. There's a massive big party. He invites his neighbours. Uh, and, and then Jesus kind of shares, well, what's the point of the story? Verse 7 again, I tell you in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent or don't feel the need to repent. There's loss and pursuit, repentance and celebration. I thought that was the first parable, this, or the first part of the parable. The second part is the parable of the lost coin. Verse 8, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels over one sinner who repents. So this woman loses a coin, loses a silver coin, which is probably a day's wage or, or something along those lines. And, uh, and again, remembering what the situation would be in, in ancient Israel, um, in first century Israel, uh, houses back then were like these square boxes and there's no windows. And so it's incredibly dark. And on the floor is not floorboards or carpet or lino, it's just dirt. And so this coin would have been dropped in the ground, probably trodden on and, and hidden somewhere in the dirt under all that. And so the woman needs to light a lamp and bring light into the darkness to search for this coin. And she sweeps the ground to remove the dirt. And, and, and it says she, she searches carefully, diligently, uh, trying to find this coin and she finds it and then has a massive party to celebrate finding this coin. One question I have of this passage is how much would it cost to have the party? Because I suspect it's more than one coin. But it just shows how excited she is to find this coin and how precious it is when, when the woman finds what was lost. And again, the point is clear. For God... And those in heaven, when just one sinner, one person who is lost, repents, comes back to God, there is a massive celebration. The loss and the pursuit of God for the loss. Repentance and celebration. And that brings us to the third parable, the third part of the parable. The parable of the two lost sons. Two lost sons. And this one's very well known again. Um, and it goes into the most detail and I think kind of explains the heart of God the Father in pursuit of the lost. And often we, we read this and we think this parable is about the son who's gone off and what he does and how he returns to the Father. But if we remember in context with the other parables, the first parable was about the shepherd who went searching for the lost sheep. The second parable was about the woman who went searching for the lost coin. The third parable is about the father who goes out searching for the lost sons. The parable is not about the son, it's about the father. And it's showing us just how far God would go to pursue the lost, that we would just turn back to him. And so it, 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 at the same time, though, it does describe the loss. What's the loss situation? And this is where the son comes to the father and he asks for his inheritance because he sees all this great stuff that the father has and evidently this is a wealthy family and the, the son is you know, in that wealthy family, probably has everything he needs, but he sees all these great things that 
belong to his father. And he reckons if I take that, if I get my inheritance, I can go off and live my way and I can do it so much better and be so much happier if I were to just take these great things from my father and go and out of his authority and out from under him, go live my own way. And so he goes and asks his father for his inheritance early. Now, normally, when you get your inheritance, that's because your, your parents have passed away and then their, their property and everything goes to the children. So to ask for an inheritance is effectively to say, I wish you were dead. I care more about your stuff than I do about you. And amazingly, the father obliges and gives half his estate to this son, to this younger son. And the son goes and travels to a a far away country, as far as he can get from out of the father's authority. He rebels. He rejects his father's safety and security. He runs away, thinking he can do better. And he lives frivolously. He, he spends all of this wealth. Uh, the word used is, is, is the word that translates prodigally, which means wastefully. That's where we get the, the story, the prodigal son, the term prodigal son, the wasteful son. And he loses it all. I'm sure it was great for a while, but he loses it all. The life he was gifted by the father, he tried to live his own way. It all falls apart in this faraway country. And the wealth that promised health and happiness weltered away, the the great new place of promise away from the Father's authority and security. It all falls through. And he's left absolutely desperate and despairing, uh, so much so that he has to resort to working in a pig farm to survive. And, and again, like, let's, let's think of this as a first century Jewish person. Jesus is speaking to Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And in Jewish culture, what animal is, is regarded as the most unclean that you cannot touch or associate with? Pigs. That's right. And so this, this man, the son, finds himself, he's working with pigs. And he even like almost identifies as a pig because he's so hungry that... He's desperate even to eat the slop that he's serving the pigs. And to the, to the Pharisees, the teachers of the laws, the, the people that Jesus is telling this parable to, you can't get more depraved and desperate and disgusting than that. You couldn't get any further away from God than the situation this, this man's in. But that's not where the story ends. The younger son, he repents. He repents. And notice why he repents. What prompts him? Uh, Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants had food to spare? And yet here here I am starving to death. He remembered that his father back home was a generous man who provided for all his servants and was generous and kind and caring to his whole household. And so he remembered the character of his father and that led him to repent, to turn back to his father. And he, he comes up with this, a, a little plan of, of how he's going to do it. He, he writes this little speech <clears throat> Excuse me, from verse 18. He, he, will, he said, he'll set out and go back to his father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So this is his plan. He plans to turn back and go back to his father. He plans to acknowledge his sin and he plans to ask for forgiveness and he plans to earn that forgiveness by becoming a slave to earn his way back into the family of his father. That's his plan. That's what he reckons needs to happen for him to go back. He's got to earn it. And so he turns and he travels to his father. This is where the scene of the parable returns back to the father. What's he doing? He isn't off in the field. You know, just he hasn't ridden this son off. 
because he's rejected him and he, he no longer cares or thinks about him. He's not walking to the sun and meeting the sun halfway. This man runs to meet his son. As soon as he sees him coming far off, he runs to go and meet him. And again, in, in this culture, the men of the household, the father, the head of the household does not run. Servants run. If you need something urgently, you send a servant to run and get it. The, the head of the household will not run. That's a dishonorable thing to do. And yet he doesn't care about the, dis, the consequences. He doesn't care what people think. He runs and he greets his son. And he runs and he embraces him and he kisses him. And remember where this son has been. Remember where this son has, has identified. He's been hanging out with pigs. He's been eating their slop. It, like He can't get more disgusting and depraved. But this father runs and he embraces him. Rebellion, uncleanness, sin, all of it. He goes, he embraces him and kisses him. And, he, and, he, and the son um, begins his speech Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But even before he can finish, the father interrupts and he goes and calls a servant and says, go, get uh, get the, 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 the robe, uh, the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. This son was lost, but the father pursues him. And this son repents and returns to the father. And the father celebrates and brings him back into his family. It's a great story. An amazing story. And it could finish there. Jesus could, finish, could have finished the story there in the scene where he's celebrating with all the family and all the household in, with this lost son. Like, what a great story. And often when we hear the story of the prodigal son, that is where it finishes. But Jesus includes this, this next little bit to talk about the older son. And I think it's, it's really... Fascinating, like why does Jesus add on this, this next little bit? Because he's talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the religious elite, the self-righteous, those who've, who've figured they've done it all and has earned the favour of God. And Jesus shares the story to, to show that God pursues not just the sinner, but also the self-righteous. And he talks about the older son. <clears throat> And from verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he calls one of the servants and asks him what's going on. He doesn't go check it out himself. He calls one of the servants. And the servant says, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf and because he, is, he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother becomes angry and refuses to go in. Doesn't, doesn't the father know just how horrible that younger son has been? Doesn't the father know like what that younger son has done and how the younger son has dishonored the father and dishonored the family? How embarrassing it is to associate, to be related to this kid? Doesn't the father know that he was, he was working in a pigsty? Like that's unclean. We're not meant to associate with that. We're not meant to touch that. Doesn't the family, doesn't the father know how horrible this younger son has been? It's not just that. When the father comes out, he, the, the younger son says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, your, your orders. The older son says, doesn't the father know how much I've done for him? How I've been obeying all this time. I've been working my butt off. I've been doing all the right stuff, saying all the right stuff, wearing all the right stuff. I've done everything that needs to be done to earn a seat at the table. And yet he's given that to the younger son. How doesn't the father know? Doesn't the father see everything that I have done? You see, the older son 
actually had the same expectation as the younger son. The younger son thought to earn his way back into the family, to get back into the family, he had to earn his way back there as a slave. But he figured, there's no way I can do that. And the older son thought the same thing, that to, to earn a place, to be, to be in, the, in God's family, in the father's family, he had to earn his way there. The only difference is the older son figured he had earned it. He had done it. And while the younger son was a sinner, the older son is self-righteous. And with that comes judgment and indulgence and arrogance. And what I found so profound reading this story and studying again this week, you know, I've, I've heard this story many times. I'm sure we've all heard it many times. It's just something that blew me away is that the father went out to pursue the older son as well. Like imagine the scene. You, you, your, your child who was gone and lost, and you thought was dead maybe, has come back. And so you're celebrating and enjoying, you know, having a party. And then the self-entitled, stubborn older brother is outside having a hissy fit, Right? Like, oh, just leave it alone. Come on, let, let's, let's party, let's celebrate. No, the father leaves the party to go pursue the self-righteous older son. Because the to have a seat at the father's table, to have a place in God's family is not based on earning that spot but about God's invitation, inviting us in. And the father extends that same invitation to the older son to come to the party, to have a seat at the table, not based on his effort that he thinks he's earned it, but based on the father's generosity and love towards that son. And that's that's what Jesus is on about. That's his message. That's his mission He's come to share that God the Father pursues all of us. That we don't earn our way back into the Father's house. We don't earn our salvation. We don't work it out ourselves. We don't have to live up to a certain standard. That to be in God's family is something that God gifts us. That he gives us. He invites us to be in his family. And that's what Jesus came to achieve. This is the message that he shared as he traveled and lived and taught all throughout Israel and the surrounding areas. But it's also what Jesus achieved because both sons had a debt to pay. The younger son had had rebelled against the father. The older son was arrogant and thought he'd sorted himself out. Both needed to be redeemed. Both had a debt to pay. And Jesus came to pay the debt of sinners and of the self-righteous. He came to pursue sinners and self-righteous. Because it's not up to us to live up to a certain standard, not up to do the right thing, say the right thing, to earn our way into God's house. It's not up to us to climb up to the mountain to meet with God, but God comes down to meet with us. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And that's the mission he's come uh, to do. That's, That's his message. And that's the message that God has gifted us, his people, to share with the world. That we don't have to earn our way back into God's favor. We don't have to earn our way into his house. And so many other religions, so many um, cultures, it's all about performance. You've got to do, and if you do enough, you say enough, you 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 are enough, then you've you've earned the right to be in the kingdom of God or to, to achieve whatever. But that's not the story of Jesus. He's come. He's achieved what needs to be achieved. He's done the work for us so that we could be part of God's family, so that we could be, we could have a seat at the table. 
And that, that is what Jesus is, all, is on about. And his love and care and compassion, not only to the lost, which is so clear, but even to the self-righteous. And what's really, again, what's really interesting is this story ends with the father saying, you know, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And we don't actually know what the older son does. Does he, does he repent himself and go into the party? Or does he remain stubborn and self-righteous and tries to earn his place on his own effort? And this is a, this is a storytelling technique trying to ask all of us reading this story later on is, what would we do? What, how are we going to respond to the invitation of God? How, what are we going to do with all this effort and everything we've done and you know the, the standard that we're living on that we've earned and, and all the stuff that we deserve that we're holding on to? What are we going to do with that? Stay holding on to it? And be entitled and judgmental? Are we going to let it go? And, and follow the invitation of God of going, being part of his house because of his love and grace towards us. How are we going to respond? I'll invite the band up. <clears throat> During the next couple of songs, there'll be, t- there'll be opportunity to pray, uh, as there often is at the back, elders, Abby, myself, ready and keen uh, to pray with you. And perhaps you might be like the younger son, where you've taken the good things of God and you've, you've reckoned you can do it yourself. You've, you, you can live a better way. You, and it's not working out. It's not the, what this world has to offer just isn't enough. And maybe we need to return to, to God, the Father who loves us. Maybe we, we, we're, we're slow to do that because we expect, oh, I need to do all this stuff. I need to fix myself before I can go and turn back to God. But the reality is, as soon as we turn back to God, God is there, all arms open, ready to receive us, running to greet us, to embrace us, to kiss us, to welcome us back into His family. We don't have to sort ourselves out, fix ourselves before God will forgive us and save us. Or maybe we're like the older son where we reckon we have lived up to God's standard, that we've done all this stuff for the Lord. Look at everything I've done for you. I deserve more. And that self-righteous attitude, we... We need a moment to realise that that older son is also lost. That we're holding on to something that just will not get us there. We can't get into the Father's house based on our own effort. We don't earn God's favour. It's given to us. And there might be stuff that, that we've, we, we need to let go of. This arrogant, self-righteous attitude of look at all I've done for God. To let go and just to be with God. Enjoy His presence, His love, His grace, His mercy, His favour. And it might, it might depend on the time of day which son you are. Because we all struggle with all these kind of things. This is, these are universal problems. There's nothing here there's no one here who, who've sinned in any way that God is surprised or, you know, it's out of His, his, his uh, scope of forgiveness. God came to pursue sinners and the self-righteous. Jesus is about seeking and saving the lost. Those who know they're lost and those who don't know that they're lost. God is pursuing you. He wants to save you. He wants to bring you home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your amazing love that just like lost sheep and lost coins, 
lost sons. We've, we've made mistakes. We've turned our own way. We're, we're alone in the dark. We've, we've tried to live our own way or we've tried to earn our own spot in your house and try to achieve your favour based on our own effort. And God, we're lost without you. We're lost. But you love us. You hunt us down. You search carefully. You bring light into dark places. You run to us. Lord, thank you so much for just the the heart of Jesus expressed through these stories. That you love the lost and even the self-righteous, the arrogant, the legalistic, And Lord, we want to confess the times that we've felt like we've done what it takes to be part of your household, that we deserve more from you, that we deserve things to go well for us, that we deserve your favour, that we, you know, we're entitled to that because we serve a church or we've done these great things or we've evangelised or we've lived this right way or we live such good lives and polished ourselves and everything looks great on the outside but Lord we know in the inside we are lost there's something missing and that's just letting all that go and receiving your embrace your loving embrace Lord we pray whatever work you need to do in our hearts that you would do that parts of our lives that need to be uncovered, where we're still lost or even hanging on to things that don't honour you. Places of our lives that that need your forgiveness. Lord, we pray you would remind us of your love, remind us of your character so that we might repent, we might turn back to you, we might acknowledge our sin and that we're lost and receive your forgiveness that you so freely offer us. And Lord, we pray that this message, this Jesus, this God and the the pursuit of the Father for the lost, that that would be a message that we would take and we would share with the world world around us. This performance-driven, performance-based acceptance world, to be able to share a message that we are loved and valued and, and pursued because of God's love, not because of our performance or our effort. That's a, that's a message the world needs to hear. And Lord, that's a message you've given us to take to the nation. So we pray you would help us and equip us to do that. Lord, we thank you for this story. We thank you for the Father's love of his two sons. We thank you for our Heavenly Father's love for the whole world. We pray and thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.